Welcome, friends, for this second half of the first day of our two-day event in Stockholm. I'm very glad to see you again. Looks so friendly to me. And I just pass and look at you. Doesn't look like me, I'm meeting first time. Look like I've seen you before. Maybe I have some other time. In the morning, I talked to you about the possibility of discovering your true self at the highest level during a human life. And because we are blocked from seeing our future, it appears we experience something which we cannot experience if we were not blocked. The experience of making a choice is a genuine, real experience. It may not be real in the ultimate sense, but as an experience, it is real. What is the advantage of having an experience like that when eventually we find it was not real? The, the benefit is, from this very experience, we can find eventually it was not. If we didn't have this experience of free will, we'd have no chance of seeing free will is not real. Free will creates conditions in which, can, which we can experience something more than merely making a choice. We can do something called seeking. We can seek something. Search, seek. That would not be possible if we knew the future that we already sought. But it's a good experience which makes us believe that the ability to go within and find the truth is offered now and we are having it now and all the experiences leading up to that discovery of the self appear like great adventure now. Though at the end we may find the whole thing was pre-planned. Pre-planned by ourselves in the highest form. That is why since we came here for adventure we didn't here, come here to get taught caught and trapped, we came here for adventure. Similar adventure that I can go to an amusement park. I go to Disneyland. I go to all these different shows. We go for entertainment, adventure, new experiences. We came here exactly for that. And provided in our planning of this trip, the way to go back to our original home also. And this seeking is part of that plan. When we seek to find the truth, it's part of the plan. If we seek, we find, period. Whoever has been seeking has found. Found what? What he was seeking. We seek worldly things, we get worldly things. We search for worldly answers, we get worldly answers. We see, seek intellectual answers, we get intellectual answers. If we seek the ultimate truth, we get the ultimate truth. If we want to seek who we really are, the ultimate self, we find that too. Seeking is the secret as an experience. And since it looks like we can decide now to seek or not to seek, it's a great experience to change from not to seek to seeking. When we seek something higher than what we know, seek something more close to ourselves than we know, we have automatically arrangements made for that. What are the arrangements? When a person seeking something in his heart, in his mind, feels ready, and, and being ready means he feels he has had enough. If somebody feels I haven't had enough, nothing will happen. You keep on enjoying, keep on suffering and enjoying together, pairs of opposites. You continue to suffer and enjoy so long as you don't feel I've had enough. First sign that you want to get away from here. Secondly, this place is too messy for me. And thirdly, this is, does not appear to be my place. It's not my home. I must have a home somewhere else. When these kind of feelings turn up, then we have reached a point in seeking when we are ready, ready to go home. At that time, 
a master appears in our life. Appears. We don't. We haven't searched for him. We have searched many masters. We have searched books. We have searched libraries. And when we are ready with those three conditions, a master appears in our life by coincidence, by accident, by strange means of series of coincidences. We were not able to seek that kind of master because we had our own definitions of who a master should be. If our mind defines who should be our teacher, we can't learn much. Then we are ourselves our teacher. If we can know what we are going to learn, we don't need any teacher. So only when we are seeking something we don't know, no, don't know at, at this time, and we don't know about what is our self, what is inside us, how can we find it? When we have these questions and we don't have answers and we are ready, a master appears in our life by coincidence. In India they say, when a chela is ready, a guru appears. When a disciple is ready, a master appears. They don't say, when a disciple is ready, he will find a master. According to me, it's impossible to find a master. Because how do we know who's a master? A perfect living master. And I give you definition of perfect living master is one who has awareness of perfection, which means awareness above the mind. Everything within the mind is imperfect. And the mind can only see things in parts and not have a whole glimpse soul above the mind, when without the mind, can have a total view of everything. Perfection lies when you can have a total view. The whole plan of creation, what's the purpose, how was it created, that comes after the mind. So to be able to go beyond the mind, very few people have achieved, even fewer than I mentioned in the morning. And that is why only when our seeking is for that state, such a master appears in our life. Many masters have appeared to satisfy our seeking for other levels of awareness or other things, good things that we want to have in life. They appear only when we want to go to the ultimate truth. We are not interested in other things, just finding out who we really are, why are we here. When they go to that level above the mind, a perfect living master who not only has gone above the mind, but is above the mind when he appears amongst us. Even as a human being living in wakeful state like us, his awareness is not confined to this state. His awareness is total at all times. It doesn't matter where he is. So will be the awareness of any one of us who reaches that state of total awareness. That never goes away. In between, till we reach that state, we can have awareness only of one level of consciousness, which we call reality. The only one level, if we had more than one level, we'll be confused about reality. Right now, our only real awareness is of this physical world. And this is our real world. That's the definition of reality, that we have nothing else to compare with. Real. When we go to a dreamland, in the dreams, this reality is shut off. The dream reality becomes reality for the time we are dreaming. It is so real in a dream that some people, me included, have had dreams in which we knew it was a dream. And we said, this is a dream. We know it's a dream. Then what do we do? We call everybody around. Do you know it's a dream? And we wake up, there's nobody around. Even knowing the truth, even speaking the truth does not mean that you realized it. Same thing here. Here we are talking of higher levels of consciousness, but we are not letting go of this reality. This level of experience and consciousness is staying with us. So that is why the structure of the experiences of consciousness are so built that at one time, you have only one reality. Dreaming, dream reality. Waking, physical reality. Astral, causal, astral reality, causal plane, causal reality, only one at a time. 
going above the mind, discovering your life force, your spirit, your soul. One reality. You still feel all others were just created. At that time, only one reality. Come back here, only this reality. You can only move in one reality up to four stages, even above the mind. Fifth one, where you go into totality of consciousness. All the realities are part of that. That's from where they originated. That's where they exist. They have not been created anything outside. Outside has been created from there. And that is why one who has reached that state of totality of consciousness, the origin of all consciousness, how do we describe that place? Do we have any words to describe a state of being, no time, space, no mind, no separation, no many, no soul, just one total consciousness? Can you describe it? Nobody described it. So for want of any word, we call it the word. The Bible says that. In the beginning was a word. Rig Veda, the oldest Veda out of the four Vedas in India, dealing with spirituality, says, in the beginning was the nod, sound. Sound, not power, not energy, sound. In Islam, they talk of Bange Aswani, the sound coming from the sky. Some have talked about the music of the spheres. I noticed that we are referring to something, sound, word, what is common? The common thing is they are audible. When we speak a word, we can hear it. When there is sound, we can hear it. Can you imagine that this power of listening is so important? Let this be described that you can listen to reality. In fact, that's what the shortcut is. The short, uh, brief way to say is that reality, ultimate reality or ultimate creative thing can be heard. How can it be heard when hearing is only limited to our sense perception in this world? No hearing above that. And we are talking of the ultimate and say it can be heard. There's a reason for that. The reason is the totality of consciousness, the ultimate creative power, which cannot be described in any words, in any language. From where the manyness has started and all the devolution has taken place into so many levels of consciousness, the self remains the same. The total self is the same as the self we are experiencing now. Everything else has changed depending on what level of awareness we are, not the self. The experiencer remains the same. Looks like there are several experiencers, but we are one experiencer experiencing the several experiencers. Every one of us is the only self, the rest are experience. Self remains all the time. And the self not only experiences creativity, it creates creative, creates creation. And supposing it stops creating creation. We are listening to that sound when we are looking at each other. We are listening to the sound when we are traveling outside. It doesn't look like sound. How am I saying that? Because it's a function of consciousness to be aware of these things and they are being created and we are experiencing. But is there a way to experience the self without reference to its creation. Supposing we say we just want to know the self and not through its creation of any kind. Does it have anything to show its existence in us? We can't doubt it. There are two things in our experience which we can never doubt no matter what. One, the experience that we exist. Nobody can deny it. Nobody ever questioned. Nobody ever asked for proof that we exist because we know we exist. Imminent knowledge that we exist. That means self is there, always. Is there a way 
without looking any part of creation just try to listen to the self to look to the self withdraw to the self is there any way by which the self expresses itself to us yes it expresses itself by turning out a musical sound which is emanating from the soul emanating from the mind emanating from the whole complex can be heard at every level right up to our totality of course hearing stops listening goes on a little further listening stops and yet how can we describe we still describe in the same terms we have used right here because we are now trying to understand something that is beyond understanding and beyond the mind it so happens that the self radiates sound radiates music radiates something which is audible it's a great thing instead of trying very hard to withdraw our attention find where is the third eye center try to figure out how to do concentrating attention that's a long cut short cut listen to the sound of the self if you listen to the sound of the self it will pull you listening draws you where you listen to and if you listen to the self you're drawn there this is the secret of the type of meditation this man taught me great master hazur maharaj baba savan singh and that's the greatest yoga i could find i tried so many yogas i don't think i left any in my young days this worked the best to discover higher than the mind and that's why he calls it surt shabd yoga surt means attention shabd means sound yoga means union with your true higher self it starts by listening in the body if your attention is there we have to do some we have to do some meditational steps to reach the point where we can start listening to the self and the sound of the self is very interesting when we are down to physical level it's a sound like a physical sound it resembles the sound of a big bell it's sometimes preceded by sound of small bells no wonder <laughs> churches put up bells temple <laughs> play with bells all religions play with the music and sound no wonder it's just an external way of explaining something by more, by putting up a model of sound that sound when it's bell like is different from any other sound actually if you were to close your ears completely close your eyes you can hear everybody can hear some sound some sound internal sound a, a japanese Japanese yogi he showed me ta once met me in a conference and he said we need silence not sound we need silence to get to the top not sound so therefore the true meditation is to be in strict state of silence i said have you attained it no but i'm trying I said I haven't met anybody who has attained it. I have heard thousands of people speaking about it, which is also sound. They speak so much about something that cannot be attained, because in the physical state where we are, it's impossible to be silent. The mind speaks all the time, no matter what you try. Not only the mind speaks, the physical body speaks. and i'm not talking gurgling in the belly or the sound of heaving or sound of breathing i am talking of several sounds the more concentrated you are you can hear thunders blowing you can hear rain falls falling so many rain falling you can see uh, so many kinds of sounds i can list many you can hear their sounds have no pull in them they are just sounds many biological sounds by blood flow put your concentration even the blood flow will create a circulatory sound and you can hear it the more concentrated your attention the more these sounds can be heard they don't mean anything on the spiritual path 
but the sound of the self, which does not come from anywhere right or left, comes from the center, right from where you are. Like surround sound, you don't know which side it's coming from. And appears to be like a bell. Dong, dong. Not only that, as you listen to the sound, the dong stops and the bong, the, be the peel of it goes on. If you listen for too long, it becomes only the peel. Continuous sound. Starts like a bell sound. That's the sound from the self. If you listen attentively, put the same attention, not on the self, on the sound of the self, you can pull your attention back much faster than the long course I was talking about in the morning. I'll talk to you more about the sound tomorrow. I'll also tell you how to go beyond the mind while you're still in a human body. Very few people have done it because most of the people have misidentified universal mind as the source of all creation. All three regions of the mind, physical, astral, causal, can be attributed to the universal mind. But not consciousness, not soul. Soul lies where there is no mind. And that is why when we want to go above the sound, no effort can make it happen. All effort of every kind is mental. To say, I am going to try, mental. You have to say, I am going to try. All effort of every kind, in meditation or otherwise, is made by the mind. Soul does not make any effort, ever. It provides life to the mind, makes it living. It can make efforts. Effortless meditation alone takes us above. That's a very tough subject, effortless meditation. A friend of mine, he discovered, he says, I have, he wrote a letter to me, I have found out that the effort does nothing to help us to go beyond the mind. So I have found out the real secret is effortless meditation. He ended the letter, I am now going to try very hard on effortless meditation. <laughs> Mind can create the sentence out of, uh, of a person who is saying, I have discovered that effortless meditation is required and he is going to make effort to be effortless. Mind's trap is very big because we are identifying with the thoughts, we are identifying with the mind, that we are the mind. That is why these things happen. Nothing, can, nothing by effort can take us beyond the mind. No kind of effort, no kind of meditation can take us above the mind. Tomorrow I'll tell you what can. I leave a little mystery for you so that you are interested in what I'm going to say. Otherwise, all of you will go away. <laughs> what is he talking about? Tomorrow we'll deal with the subject of how we can go to totality of consciousness above the mind without effort. I know some of you must have written some questions. And if I can answer a few. Will somebody read them and then I can read them again? You have them? Or no questions have been asked? Is it true that the way I think and behave will create a karmic reaction in somebody else, whether negative or positive? Answer, yes. Karma is created by interactions and we are creating karma. Most of our karma is by interaction with other human beings. Most of the payoff of karma is also between interaction of human beings. Answer is clear, yes. Ishraji, 
Whenever I listen to your sup songs, I find it difficult to stay awake. Sometimes it is easy to listen, and I am very keen to listen, but you calm me down so much that I fall asleep. Why don't you do this? <laughs> Whenever I listen to your satsangs, which mean discourses or talks, I find it difficult to stay awake. You are not alone. <laughs> <laughs> not only listening to satsang, in Wisconsin, USA, I was once teaching people how to meditate. I asked them, close your eyes, withdraw your attention. After a while, I felt I was snoring. <laughs> I opened my eyes. I was snoring. Everybody staring at me. <laughs> Not only listening to satsang, speaking of satsang makes you go to sleep. Of course, I turned it around and said, this is an example what happens. <laughs> to my advantage. But that was, why does this happen? Sometimes it is easy to listen. And I'm very keen to listen, but you calm me down so much that I fall asleep. Why do you do this? <laughs> I don't do anything. <laughs> it's, it's your experience. You are doing it to yourself. Why does it happen? Because when we listen to something that is not of this world, not of the worldly experience, we are trying to listen and experience little bit at the same time when we're listening. It's automatic. I say, when we do this, as your thought comes, when I do this, it's automatic that you try to imitate that little bit at the same time when you're listening to understand it better. When you try to pull your attention in, the process is very similar to the process of sleeping at night. It's just a shift of attention. At night, what happens? The attention, which is operating from third eye center, does not seem to be operating from the third eye center, the physical body, seems to descend. Comes down, when it's a little down, it's sleepy. We feel sleepy. When it goes down, here, we are dreaming. When it goes down, forget, deep sleep, forgotten dreams. This is a continuous process we are doing in the energy centers below the eyes. Continuous, every night we do it. So that is why when we're listening to something and trying to understand it, something, if I say I'll describe pizza and ice cream to you, you'll never go to sleep. <laughs> but when I talk of things which are not visible outside but depend on what is inside, your tendency is to say, what is he showing? Where is it? We try to ex experiment side by side, little bit. And the attention moves the same way, like in sleep. And that's why we feel so sleepy. That is why I tell jokes sometimes in the middle of my talk. It wakes up people immediately. Also, the subject is deep. I remember a great scientist who was giving a talk on space technology of the future. How we can go to different levels of space and what will happen to the awareness of space if we are at very high altitudes above 65,000 feet. There's a cutoff point at 65,000 feet for some reason, and the technicians know about it. He was trying to explain that. The different packets of space exist. Half the audience want to sleep. They couldn't understand. They tried to and fall asleep. Suddenly, he stopped. And he said, do you know why these fire engines are red? Everybody woke up. Fire engines are outside. They are painted red. And he's simple asking, do you know why the fire engines are red? And people were saying, why has he put this question in the midst of his talk about space? <laughs> he said, the child asked me this question. A small child asked me, why are fire engines red? And I told him, you know, red is the color of fire. He said, not exactly. I said, okay, red is color of danger. He didn't accept my answers. 
and he said, I'll tell you why fire engines are red. He said, fire engines are red because they have four wheels and eight men. Eight, four and eight makes twelve. Twelve inches is a foot. A foot is a ruler. Queen Elizabeth is also a ruler. Queen Elizabeth was also the name of the largest ship that sailed the seven seas. Seas have fins. Fish, fish have fins. The fins fought against the Russians. Fire engines fire are always Russian, therefore they are red. <laughs> Everybody woke up and he continued his speech. <laughs> they, they, I'm only telling you, otherwise they were sleeping. So sometimes, uh, not, I don't, don't do it for uh, merely waking up people. Very few people sleep, very, and I'm surprised at that. But I tell a few jokes. Everybody enjoys jokes. Did you like the joke which I told Jonathan Joe? Yes. That's very much appreciated. Can I tell now again? Yes. Okay. Once upon a time, that's how we start a story. Once upon a time, there was a pastor of a church who had two parrots, and he had trained those parrots to say holy words from the Bible, sing hymns. And he also gave them beads in their hands so they could move the beads and say holy words. Great atmosphere was created. And people enjoyed seeing those parrots. And there, one of the par parishioners, he went to the pastor. Pastor, you've done such a good job having trained these parrots. And they said nice things all the time. So it makes a very nice, holy ambience. The pastor said, you can also have parrots and have the same thing. They're trained. Parrots are trained. Whatever you speak to them, they repeat. So you can train them to say anything. So the parishioner went to the pet shop and bought two parrots, brought them home. Unfortunately or fortunately, I don't know. <laughs> the two parrots were female parrots. And when he opened the cage in the house, they both spoke at the same time. We are hookers. You want to have a good time? <laughs> he's the best, best parishioner was shocked. What kind of parrots have I brought? So he went to the pastor again. He said, I brought the parrot, but this is what kind of language they're using. The pastor said, you can retrain them. Maybe... The owner of these parrots earlier put these words into their mouth. You can retrain them. In fact, he said, you can take my two parrots. And when they will see, your parrots will see my parrots holding beads in their hands and speaking holy words, they will also learn. So the parishioner borrowed the two parrots and brought them home. And he opened the cage and the two parrots with their beads began to say holy words. When the female parrots were brought before them, the female parrot said, we are hookers, you want to have a good time? On that, one of the pastor's parrot, parrot looked at the other one, and he said, throw away your beads, our prayers have been answered. <laughs> Old joke. <laughs> now we can go to serious stuff, right? <laughs> Everybody is awake, I can see. Is it okay to visit one's previous spiritual master, who is not a PLM, any do's and don'ts? Absolutely right to visit any master that shows you the right way. Right way is only one inside. If a master says, go to the shrine, go to the mountain, go to the river, that's where you will find the truth. Not the right way. Don't go to such a master. If a master says, go within, definitely go. If he says, go one step, good. You have to take the first step to take the second. No harm at all. No matter what the level of a master, no matter how far he's gone, he is good for us at that time. And that is why we set off on our journey. If after spending time with that master, 
you find that you are stuck, can go no further. And you consult the master, and he cannot help you to go any further. Then you seek more and wait. A master, if you are seeking is higher, a higher master will appear in your life. If you have reached the top of the mental seeking and mental experiences, and you still are not satisfied, you want to find who you really are, not your mind. A perfect living master will appear. But this does not mean that you give up the existing master. Actually, every master that comes during the course of our seeking is helping us at that point. Sometimes we are not ready for the ultimate at all. Sometimes we can't even understand what is all this talk about. But a simple master who says meditation will calm you down, let you see your soul, do some yoga, do exercises with the physical body, lie down like a dead body, and some one of the poses, 84 poses are prescribed even for yoga, which does not take you beyond the mind and is only dealing with energies of the six centers below. Still, it's good to have it. It gives you peace of mind, calmness, ability to spend time. But some people think that those exercises will make us spiritual. No. Not exercises, physical exercises of any kind can make you spiritual. Why were this prescribed then? The whole compilation, I've seen, 84 different positions of the body, postures, as part of yoga. The reason they were prescribed is all these exercises, 84 of them, can be done in a confined space. And those old meditators, when they meditated for awareness, they did these exercises for energy because they were in caves, small caves where they meditated. There wasn't space enough. And they, they defined these, if you do all 84, every muscle of your body is activated, energized. It was meant for physical good health. If you have no physical good health, what happens? You cannot concentrate your attention anywhere except where the ill health is. Supposing my leg is hurting, my knee is hurting. I'm going to do meditation. I'll be meditating on my knee because my thoughts will be this is hurting. How can I take my attention away from pain? Pain is a very strong holder of attention. In fact, they say if somebody gets a little doubtful, is this world real or not? Give him a little pain, he says it's real. <laughs> Shakespeare says in one of his plays, there never yet was philosopher who could bear the toothache patiently. He could give discourses. And pain is not real. Everything is unreal. Okay, give him a little dentist chair. I'm going to go to the dental chair. I know it. <laughs> in fact, I told some of you the story when I was very young, maybe nine or ten. I remember my size, not the age exactly, not taller than this. A holy man came to the Dera of Great Master. The Great Master used to give teachings. And he sat on one of the platforms built there and began to discourse to people. I have reached higher than mind. I have reached higher than that. I have done all this. Normally, a man who has done this does not boast about these things. There's great humility in such a person. He does not take credit for any of these things. This man was shouting that he's done this, he's done that. And I, I saw this man is making a fool of everybody. But I was too small to challenge him. But fortunately, I had a safety pin with me. I don't know why I carried to tie something. I opened the safety pin the sharp edge, I went behind and poked it in him. <laughs> he got up so angry, so mad, and ran after me. But I knew I could run faster, which I did. I said, where is your higher ascent where the pain disappears? Where have you lost those things which are gone when you do go over the way? And I ran away. Pain creates reality for us. So that is why if your body is in good shape, in good health, meditation is better. Some people try to follow very difficult asanas 
as if they are responsible for great spiritual uplift. They make leg cross over the other leg. They are not used to it at all. It's aching and paining. I am meditating now. <laughs> what are you meditating on? <laughs> on your feet and legs and knees. There was one disciple who was following this same Surth Shabd Yoga, same teaching of the same my master's teaching he was following. And he was meditating according to instructions. Instructions were if you can, like you give one tenth of your income for tithes, give one tenth of your time for meditation. 24 hours, one tenth is two and a half hours. So he meditated two and a half hours. He was in San Francisco, USA. I was in India. He invited me to come and visit him. So I came and I was tired, long journey from India. I wanted to sleep. But when he, I went there, he said, very good, Ishwar, you have come here and you are such a person with experience. Would it be okay, we'll meditate together, 3 a.m. in the morning. Now, just to keep my face, yes, I'm a very uh, advanced person, which I was not. I said, okay, we'll meditate together. I sat in the morning, cross-legged, like he sat, cross-legged, eyes closed meditating. He had set an alarm by which we woke up at 3 o'clock. And as we were sitting, he must be meditating, but I was not. I was interested in knowing what is he doing. So from time to time, I would open the corner of my eye to see what he was doing. I don't know what it was coincidence or what. Every time I looked there, he was looking like this at his watch. <laughs> Every time. I don't know why it happened. Couldn't be looking all the time. So therefore, somehow coincidentally, two and a half hours passed with great difficulty. At that end of that, he says, very good meditation. I'm so happy you are here. I said, my friend, it was very good meditation. It was meditation of the watch, <laughs> not of the self. How can you be meditating if these distract, distractions are so much there. In fact, a large part of our time on trying to find the truth is to know how to deal with these distractions. Distractions, mental distractions disturb you far more than even the external distractions. Memories, attachments, desires, painful memory, memories, they pull you back. You can't succeed. There are techniques how to get distract, avoid distraction. Techniques how to get somewhat detached during meditation. It's not easy. And therefore, definitely, <coughs> the question was very simple. <laughs> Should we go to masters, previous masters, who were not PLM? PLM stands for perfect living master. Yes, please do. If fate is predetermined, predestined, does that not also mean we should accept suffering? Answer, yes. Is it not cruel and wrong as this would mean other suffering are meant to be? Yes, cruel and wrong. Sufferings are meant to be... Uh, am I not responsible for my fellow human beings? No. First two parts, yes. Third part, no. Why is that? To understand karmic suffering and karmic pleasure, you have to understand the whole principle. How cause and effect in events affects our life here. When we talk of karma, we are not talking of just suffering. It's talking of good things and bad things. Question is only dealing with suffering. What about rewards? Happiness. If we share happiness with others, are we responsible for their happiness? We are happy. Somebody else is happy. 
my younger daughter has a habit of giggling all the time laughing giggling no matter what and in a business she did better as a part time worker than the others the chairman of the bank where she was working heard that one part time girl is doing better than the full time employees what's the secret so he visited the branch called the other branch managers of the banks and they called my daughter her name is simi they called her to ask how do you do better you have done more business than these full time people and she says i don't know i i work my best me i they couldn't ask them so he asked the manager manager said yes he is a good worker other worker of the same bank said we know what happens she laughs and giggles all the time and we can't help giggling and laughing when the customer laughs they give business to her actually is nothing surprising we have eight senses five are senses of perception i mentioned in the morning sixth sense is called what is sixth sense called sixth sense intuition has been called sixth sense we have sixth sense seventh sense is actually more important in human life in the quality of human life and it's called common sense very uncommon what is common sense the ability to distinguish between the grain and the chaff to prioritize your life better that's common sense if you prioritize your life better it improves immediately these the priorities we give sometimes we waste so much time on trivial things especially fighting with our spouses especially talking from experience <laughs> especially we argue over such useless subjects said no value two days later we say what did we waste time getting angry over nothing so we have not prioritized our life these don't require that attention on the other hand the great opportunity open to us as human beings to be able to find out who we are to find that suffering and joy and pleasure and rewards everything is right here that it does not exist it was created for experience to be able to find out answers to all our questions that's a greater subject to give priority than to get involved in little things that are happening here supposing you are having a, a dream in the dream you meet somebody an adversary you don't like as a great argument you argue argue that you wake up so it was only a dream what was a wasting time in the dream of course sometimes you like to go once i had a dream that i won a lottery 5 million dollars very lucky i said my numbers came out right and they brought special bank manager check or cash i said cash i want to see 5 million dollars as they were going to deliver to me i woke up i tried very hard to go to sleep again <laughs> at least to collect the money then i can wake up we get we get so attached to these things and then we desire them more the attachment and desire pulls us right here all the time and that is why it's not easy it's it's not at all uh, possible for a person who's having these kind of pulls to concentrate attention karma is created I'll just take a few minutes more. Karma is created through intention followed by action or not followed by action. Is one clarification. A lot of people have translated the word karma as action. Not true. Karma is intention to act. If you have an intention to act, you have created karma. If you act upon it, further amplification of that karma. If, if the intention is good, you get rewarded. If you act upon the good intention, more reward. If your intention is to hurt somebody, bad karma, you are punished. If you actually not only intend but actually hurt, even more punishment. Karma works like this. When do you create it? When you have time to practice your intention 
which is called deliberation in your head. You have to think, should I do it or not? Then free will is used to decide something, you create karma. The ethical issue of it, what is good karma, bad karma, often changes with societies, with the environmental experiences you're having. From outside creation, the ethical models are set up. At some point, the same thing is good, another point becomes bad. In the same person's life, things turn from good to bad. At that particular point, whatever your evaluation is of good and bad, the karma created accordingly. It has to be paid off. It's a cause to which there must be an effect. And it's paid off automatically. Now, when it is paid off, how does it happen? It happens without deliberation. Supposing somebody hits me by accident and says, sorry, he didn't intend to hit me. He still hit me. If he says, I let me hit this fellow, he hits me, same thing. Event is the same. One, he had deliberated creating a karma. Other, he did not hit me, paid off an old karma, which I owed to him to be hit. I hit, hit him in the past, this life or previous life. And he's paying off a karma. When we say we have a destiny, we are born with a destiny. In karmic language, we have called it pralabdha, or fate or destiny with which we are born. We are carrying it from birth. Those are events which are happening without deliberation. When we deliberate and think of new things in between, we create new karma. If you examine your life, you'll see about 80% of your life is not created by your thinking, not by your deliberation. Where you are born, where you will die, where you will have an accident, who you will meet, you don't determine these things, part of destiny. And destiny creates these events for you. But when you are in the destiny, 20% of the time, you get time to think when choices open up. Choices have to open up, giving you a choice. Do this or that. Do this or not do this. When choices open up, that's when we create karma. And that is why the whole play of the rule of karma is what is sustaining our experiences here. All events we are having here can be traced to either a destiny or a new karma. New karma they call karemon karma. That means you're creating it now. Old destiny is called pralabdha karma. You brought it before at the time of even conception, you have it with you. But we create far more karma than we pay off in one human life because of intention. If you count all the intentional karma you have created, it will take hundreds of lives to pay it off. Only some part of it is played in the next life. Some people try to lead a karma-free life. How? Not going to deliberate. I'll, what they in America used to call, go with the flow. Old thing, go with the flow, karma-less living. Whatever happens, go with it. Don't think twice. You have to think about something, ask somebody's advice, go with it. Even they have collected so much karma, which could not be paid off even in that life, but it is not destroyed, it is stored. It is stored in a section of the mind, which is called sinchit karma, reserve karma. We always have so much reserve karma. Some of the elements from even previous to previous lives can be pulled out to create a new life. It's a very big trap. If you study this whole business of reincarnation and study from a practical point of view by going into it and experiencing some of these things, you'll notice it is almost a trap from which one can never get out. So long as we are in the three worlds of the mind, there is no way to end the karma. It's only if you can go beyond the mind, there's no karma there at all. The soul has never had any karma, never will. The mind carries all karma. When we begin to identify with the mind, it becomes all karma. If we are able to situate ourselves within ourselves as witnesses of the show, witnesses of life, that we are not mind, witnesses of our thoughts. If we separate ourselves, they're witnesses of our thought, witnesses of actions, witnesses of the show outside. 
you'll have no karma. You see karma be played out by the mind. That's the great advantage of the ability to withdraw your attention beyond the mind into the soul alone, of which I'll talk to you tomorrow. But this is not only suffering, happiness, joy. All these when we share, it's everybody's karma who participates in it. A mother is taking care of her sick child. Child is suffering because of sickness. Mother is suffering because of that. Both are paying off their old karma. A, a, a child has got wonderful results in the exam. Parents are so proud and happy. All are sharing the karma from the past. When you have pure and shaken mind, you When you have pure, unshakable faith in your master, is anything else needed? No. That alone is enough to take you to the top, if your master is at the top. It will be his job in whom you have so much faith. If he is a perfect master, it is 100% his job to take you to your true home. If there is self in everyone, which is the self that is one, you say the self is always there, then there are numerous people. So how can there be so many real selves? If there is self in everyone, which is the self that is one, you say self is always there, then there are millions of people, so how can there be so many real selves. None of them are real selves. They are human beings. They die. Self never dies. They are minds. Minds die, maybe in a million years. Minds die. They are not self. Neither mind, nor bodies, nor sense perceptions are self. Self is that which is only one, becomes many for experiences within itself. Here's a cup of water. Can I say there's one water or two waters? One water. Right? Sip it now. There's a chance to take a little sip of water. <laughs> Did I take one water? It's still one. What happened to the one I took? Water consists of drops of water. There's not one drop. So many drops. Otherwise, I couldn't have taken some drops, it's still one water. This water that I'm showing you consists of how many drops? 10, 20, million, billion, trillion? How many can you see? All the numbers are correct, depending upon the size of the drop. Supposing you have a million drops of this water sitting in this glass. They're sitting in the glass. They're part of one, yet they're millions. What separates? Supposing I say million drops in one water, what is making the million? Something in the glass or in our heads? In our heads. We imagine the size of the drop to be smaller in awareness they become million. We expand our awareness, one water. That's the relationship of the soul with the oneness. It's oneness within the same. In fact, when I was young, I had great problem in understanding spirituality when it was explained to me that we as souls were part of the one and somehow we got separated from the one and came down to various levels of different worlds. Now we are landed up far away in this physical world. Spiritual path is a journey back to that oneness. You struggle hard, go up and join. Ultimately, you merge in that water. Merge in that. They even described the reality is an ocean, one ocean. We are all drops from that ocean. And we people, unfortunately, have been separated. These drops have been separated. One day, with great struggle, with meditation, with spiritual training, we will go and merge in that 
I, I, as a thinker, in my young age, could not believe such a thing could be really a good thing. As a drop, I have a personality. Sun shines, rainbow creates by the drop. It's a drop, has a personality, individuality. They are telling me, take all the effort to go back to the source, the ocean, and get merged in it. What will the ocean gain? One drop? What will I gain? Nothing. I lose myself. This is a lose-lose game. That's what I thought about spiritual path. That if this is true, what they are explaining, I'll never try to do this. But I was wrong. I didn't realize that the truth is totally different. Truth is we never left the ocean. The truth is we never left anywhere. We are part of the ocean. The only thing that made us drops was contraction of awareness to the size of a drop. That was the soul. All other things, all other things like mind, body, senses were added on for more experiences to the drop, which are experiences of the ocean. There was no separation. Therefore, when we say we merge, we don't merge. We expand our awareness to totality. As we go, we expand our size of the drop and ultimately become the ocean itself. So in a way, people have said, you might have seen a drop in an ocean. Have you ever seen the ocean in a drop? Yes, it is there. Because this is a game of awareness. When you are in this physical body, it's like a little small part of this created world. But where is the created world? Where it originates? Where does it originate? Inside your consciousness. You're carrying the ocean inside the drop. You're carrying the awareness of totality inside a drop of single soul in a single body. So that is why this is exactly different. And when you know the whole spiritual path is a question of expanding your awareness and going to totality. It defies this uh, whole explanation of a drop having left the ocean and gone anywhere. So the many we are seeing are not real. They are made real by cutting off reality. The thoughts that we see and say we are thinking like that are not real. They are made real by cutting off the reality of consciousness through which the mind experiences. These realities have been created. But at the same time, you can say they're not real when you find something higher. In a dream state, people we see in the dream are not real. Then we wake up, they disappear. Not all of them. Let me explain that a little bit. When we go to sleep, we dream, and then we are in a conference. Strange faces are in the conference. Four or five, we recognize our friends are also there. Friends that we know from wakeful state, they are also in the dream. Many are not. When we wake up, what the difference between the friends we saw in the dream and the others we saw in the dream, the others were completely fictional. They don't exist. They were made up for the dream. The friends we saw exist in the dream. When we open our eyes, they also exist in the waking state. What would happen if we were to wake up again? We'll find that some friends we have seen here are there too. And they are in the same form like we are. Supposing we wake up again and again, we'll find so much creation created. One friend is still there. Same as you saw in the physical plane. When we reach the top, we find the same friend is there and we find the friend and the self are the same. This is a spiritual path. So therefore, there is somebody up there, the self, which appears all the way along right up to here. And when we are here, the self gets confined to one experience. The many that are generated at each experience they dwindle in size as they go into deeper experience of less awareness. So it's a very interesting way this whole thing has been set up. So when we say, what about millions of people there? They created millions in this level of reality and they are real while we are here real. Why are they not unreal while we are here? Because we are operating through the same body, same self, same definition which they have. If we are looking at from somewhere else, what would we find? 
if they are not real, so are we not real. If their body is not real, our body is not real. We have created a, a form of ourselves and we see all other forms which are similar in matter as real. Reality is a created thing at all levels. Our definition of reality changes as we go from one level of consciousness to another. I said we are checking reality here by one sense perception corroborating the other. That's our only means. At other levels, we corroborate with perceptions also, but in a different way. At the top, in the universal mind, where there is no such thing, we corroborate reality whether it fits with our thoughts or not. Above that, what is conscious, what is conscious, what is not. Reality is different. And we create our reality. We don't create illusion. Some people have wrongly said, oh, this world is illusion. Pen prick will tell it, change it. Whoever claims this is an illusion, I can prove to him it is not. One safety pin. Pain can make it real any time. How can you call it illusion? How can you call any experience illusion? I am seeing you. Can I say it's illusion? No, I'm seeing. How I'm seeing is different. But to deny that your experience is not real is wrong. Experience is always real because you're having it. A conscious experience, no matter at what level of awareness we are, a conscious experience is real. But then we create reality from that experience. I'll give you again one example. Another, another sip of water, you know. I have just had a sip of water from this glass. Was it real or not? I held the glass with my hands, real. I tasted the water, real. I saw the water, real. I put it down, this glass is real, the water is real, taste is real. Is it true? The glass is real, water is real, and the lemon in it is real? Okay, now let's go, before we answer this question, let's go to a dream state. I'm dreaming and somebody offers me the same glass of water, with the same water, same lemon in it. And I am addressing a group of people like you, in my dream. And I'm trying to prove that the glass is real. I'm doing the same thing. I'm saying, here's a glass of water, and I taste it and say, isn't it real? Everybody says real. I also say real. Then I wake up. Was the experience of drinking the water real? Yes. I still remember it. It's not gone. The experience of drinking the water, looking at the glass, was real. Was the glass real? No. It disappeared when I woke up. When they try to describe the nature of illusion, that creates this world, they forget this part. Illusion is not that the world is illusion. The world is that the real experience of this world is being misunderstood as the creation of an outside world. Experience is real, and that experience is making this reality. We are not creating illusions, creating realities. This is true up to the highest level of awareness, that what we create is experience is always real. Always, every experience. You have it? How can you deny what you're having? But when we jump to the conclusion, because we have an experience of the glass, the glass must be real, that illusion. And by waking up, we find the illusion. You are looking at this world, very real. If it was not real, tell me, very simple question. If I have even slight enlightenment in me, slight, and I know this is not real, why would I be talking to you? Why am I talking to somebody that's unreal? Why am I wasting my time and talking one day and wake up and find none of you existed? Why am I, if I'm really enlightened, I'm not enlightened at all if I take you as real and I'm giving you a talk. Yet, what the truth is, this body of mine makes me this reality real. So long as I say this body of mine, material body is real, all material bodies are real. The whole material world is real. 
when I leave this body and go to another awareness, everything in that awareness is real because we're experiencing it. It's the experience that generates reality. And we have several levels of realities, sometimes called levels of consciousness. No difference between the two. Okay. One more question. I departed from it. I saw the signs. Okay, one more question. Then we have some personal time interviews. Uh, a number of people. If the discovery itself is available to everyone, if the discovery of the self is available to everyone of us, then why is Mad not using it more? I'm preparing for my next statement. <laughs> you folded the dust? Okay. First is not a question. Love you. I also love you. We, we say love you so often sometimes. If you really love somebody, it's very hard to say that. That's my experience and some other people's experience that you get pretty speechless if there's sudden experience of love. But it is a common courtesy to say love you. But when you have real love inside, it pulls you. Love is a pull, not words. And when you're pulled by somebody, can't forget that person, miss that person, that's love. <coughs> Needs no words. More about it tomorrow. If discovery of self is available to every one of us, then why humanity is not using it more? I don't know. I wish they did. But then not, that's not the pattern of creation. The pattern of creation is to keep this a unique part of the creation of humanity. That's the pattern. It's a pattern. It's not undesigned creation. You can see the design. You can see how they are different people, how the different nationalities, how different languages. It's designed to create more and more of the many. And when there's more and more of the many, designed to be experienced by consciousness, you can't just destroy all of them. It's like saying, I saw that show on the stage. And if all those people are acting there are not real, we are the real viewers, why not destroy the stage? We don't destroy the stage which we have set up ourselves. We, consciousness has set up the whole stage of experiencing, set up several stages of experiencing. And therefore, the intention is not to wipe it out, of course, at some time, in the time frame that has been set up, we do destroy everything. And everything is destroyed. This will also be destroyed one day. In India, we call it paralaya, dissolution. That one day, this whole creation will be dissolved that we can see with our eyes. There's also a mahaparala, grand dissolution, when even the higher levels of awareness will be destroyed. That happens. That has happened several times over. It will happen again. We don't want to go to the same show every time. We set up a new stage, a new show every time. So that is why they so designed that few souls, marked souls, at different times come up. Eventually, all have come from the same origin. All will go back to the same origin. It doesn't mean that others will stay somewhere else. When dissolution takes place, grand dissolution, everybody goes back to the same state. So that is why it's only a part of the play that some in this play, who, which is created as reality, are able to have the, take the advantage. How many perfect living masters are living on earth today? My great master expressed an opinion on that question. He said, perfect living masters who have risen above the mind are very few they can be counted on the fingers of the two hands, which amounts to eight, eight or less, existing at this time. And there are more today than there were some time back. There's another one. Where does soul go after death? Soul does not go anywhere. Soul does not come anywhere, does not go anywhere. Soul stays where it is. Experience creates a feeling it has gone somewhere. 
It's the mind and experience that makes it feel. New experience comes, we are there where the experience is. So that is why when we say soul transmigrates to new body, we have a previous life, we come here, we are talking, we are not talking of soul. We are talking of mind, and senses and body. Mostly it's the internal sense perception that travel and looks like they've gone because space-time is there in all three levels. So they travel from one place to another. Soul is steady. It is true home. We are having all the experiences. <clears throat> Can you see previous life times by meditating and going to causal region? Yes. You can see all your previous lives. One more thing about previous lives. They may not exist. You will still see them. You may never have lived them. You will still see them. Why? There is no previous life in the soul. Where did the previous lives come from? Supposing we say, let's take it a physical example. You come for the first time here. And you say, you cannot come here in physical body unless you have a previous karma of a previous life. You never had a previous life. You are coming for the first time. But the first life cannot be created under the laws of creation of this universe, of this physical universe, unless we apply the rule of cause and effect. There has to be cause, and therefore there have to be previous lives. Therefore, when we choose our destiny in the causal plane, it's like a DVD being picked up to play. The only difference between playing a DVD is we are separate from the DVD. When we choose this DVD to play a worldly destiny, we become part of one of the actors in there. Not part. We just sit in the head of one actor. A DVD still. But to make it more realistic, as real as possible, we don't view from a distance we go right into any one character and sit in the head of that character and we think that is our, that is our self, our character. Makes the show wonderful. But it cannot be created without previous lives. So the package that we pick up has a previous life. Previous lives can't exist without a still previous life. It is infinite previous lives in the package. Infinite future lives. We come only for one life. But once we start taking it as real, then we go into real next life, real as experiences. So that is why when you go to the causal plane, you can see all the past lives, some lived in, some notional, which are required to make up one life. Is there another question? Yeah, that's it. Okay. List of people. Who want personal time? So I'll have to cut short some of my sharing of God, of my experiences with you, not ideas. I don't believe in too much in ideas, it's more in experiences. Share more of your experiences tomorrow, and I want to spend some time with those people who are in this list. They can't see all of them. I'll postpone tomorrow, need to more time to them. It's only a two-day program, so I hope I'll be able to see all of them in the list. If some are left, over, left out, cannot come, always available for questions on email, always available to come again to the next event. Events are going on all the time in different places. I just came from London and Spain, and I see some faces here also. Maybe they didn't get time to have questions there, or maybe they just want to be good friends of mine and give me moral support for coming here. <laughs> Thank you very much, whatever the reason. Thank you very much for listening to me patiently. I'll see you tomorrow, 11 o'clock.